What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? Well, we'd have to go back to the 1954, 53, 54, maybe 55, when I used to go to uh, the movie house with my grandmother and then go watch Mexican movies at the uh, unique theater. And then when my father used to take us to uh, the Grauman's Chinese and the Egyptian and the El Capitan and the, the Paramount then at that time in the 50s and watch, uh, you know, all these incredible movies that would just like blow your brains apart. Storytelling was unleashed on me when I was very young. And, uh, and it's the reason why I, I do what I do. So basically, um, I'm very grateful to uh, have been and a privilege to have been able to live my life inside of this art form. It's stunning. The, the performances, and actually I didn't see them on, at the film. I saw them on television in the early 50s. And uh, that was Paul Muni. You know, exposed to Paul Muni, who uh, did The Good Earth and had done uh, uh, Pasture and he did um, Scarface, the original. And um, I started to watch his work and I was stunned by the, the difference that each character was. And it was the same actor, but it was he was always so different. And uh, even though he was using the same mechanism, which was his face and his body, he just he would do extraordinary things. And I saw uh, Lon Chaney, and Lon Chaney did uh, extraordinary work, especially when they did a, a film on him called "The Man with a Thousand Faces." And uh, those in the early '50s had a tremendous impact on me. And then uh, that was really the motivating factor for for getting into the artistic endeavor of acting. But uh, storytelling, my God, the art, my culture tells stories. They're, they're, they're really uh, big in, on storytelling. And, uh, you know, like they would sometimes, uh, you know, tell us stories as we're going to sleep. And um, not from a book. <laughs> you know, but uh, from uh, you know my great great grandparents and my grandparents and my parents would you know come in and talk with us and tell us stories and even when we we're sitting around the table and uh, those are always the best and they were always some of my 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 grandparents were brilliant storytellers they knew how to phrase they knew how to excite you they knew how the tempo of words and how to pronounce them and how to get you inside of the situation so that pretty soon you're seeing the whole thing you know and i, I thought that was really often the best and uh, it got me involved in in, in being outwardly uh, expressive and uh telling stories like they would tell stories since a little kid so uh, my storytelling started young and uh, I went into rock and roll music and I started playing the 1960 rock and roll music every day, seven days a week. I started to get involved in music and I'd learned to dance. So when I was 10 years old, my father was teaching us how to dance, mambo, cha-cha-cha, swing, two-step, foxtrot, ballet, I mean, uh, uh, tango. My father was a, he wasn't a classical dancer. He was just a dancer. He liked dancing, him and his family. So they were all when they were, we ever got together, it was 11 brothers and sisters with all of their children. And so we would all be dancing, just the, the family within itself, we, we just would all dance. And so it was really great. And um, so I ended up getting into music and I was listening in 1955, 56 to, you know, KFWB and, and listening to Little Richard, you know, James Brown, Elvis Presley, you know, uh, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, Ella Fitzgerald, and, uh, Etta James and all of these different people that were singing and, and he just like, it was like, you know, it, it was a big switch from in 54, 55, it really a big switch from music that we're listening to before that. And so for music, I went to theater in 1964. I got into theater at East LA Community College. I took my first acting class along with the stuff that I had learned in music and movement and singing and performing and, 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 then and dancing at 10 and then playing baseball and being very proactive in in my youth it all kind of started to stretch itself into this world that i 
find myself in Nod 73. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? The thing that the most got me involved with with this was trying to find a way, because I was a rock and roll singer, so I was trying to find a way of expressing myself and learning how to do this on stage. And I was a good stage performer. I wasn't a good singer. I never could sing very well at all, but I could perform really well. And so people would come to watch me and they would watch me sing, but really what they were watching was the performance. And uh, I performed seven days a week for, you know, almost eight years. And um, it was a long, I mean, people didn't get it. I mean, they say, what do you mean you worked? Yeah, I worked on stage uh, every single day. And I was always performing. And then they go, that's, un- yeah, come on. You get- yeah, I did. Seven days a week, we were performing on the stage. Four years of that was at Gazards on the Census Trip. Two years was at the factory. And then two years on in different nightclubs across uh, the San Fernando Valley. And... Um, and people just phew, makes their mind blow that, that anybody could. And I say to them, I say, what are you talking about? Don't you brush your teeth every day? Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you brush it twice? Some people brush twice. Well, no, I brush it once. I go, you should try it twice because it's better for your teeth and your mouth. And they all laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Well, I said, do you really get off? Do you get orgasmic out of brushing your teeth? No, you do it because you have to. Now you sit around doing something that you don't like to do, that you that you don't want to do, but you have to, and you can do it seven days a week. Why can't I do something that I love to do seven days a week when I want to do it, even though I don't want to do it? Sometimes I still make myself do it. It's like you make yourself brush your teeth every day. I make myself do this every day, but I do it. I do it, and so you know, ten thousand hours, man. I learned that ten thousand hour thing, and like when I was seventeen, eighteen, I had never heard about it. And I said, wow, did I, did I get on this one fast? Baseball, it helped me like crazy. And music, it helped me like crazy. And theater, it helped me like crazy. In 1978, I did Zoot Suit, and it was all over. Once I got into doing Zoot Suit, my whole world changed. I was allowed as an artistic endeavor to create. I went straight from Zoot Suit. The first thing I did was Wolfen with Albert Finney and me together. I had total control of my character, Eddie Holt. And I went on to do it. Then I went into Blade Runner. I had total control of my character and Gaff. It was all over. And then I went into Zoot Suit the movie. And then I did the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez. And I did uh, uh, Miami Vice. And I always had total control of my characters. Whether it was your own work or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you belonged? I never had that. Uh, I never, ever once did I have the security of thinking that I could do this as a living. Ever. Um, it happened. It happened because of the structures, the way that it turned out. I had the opportunity. I was lucky. Luck means that you're given the opportunity and you're prepared for that opportunity. Preparation meaning opportunity, that's luck. Okay, I got lucky. And by being lucky, I did Zutsu, where I was singing, I was dancing. I was doing comedy, I was doing drama, I was playing a character that had never been seen before in the history of American theater ever on stage. And it was the first time that this culture was coming out. And when I hit, I hit with, they came from all over the world to see that performance. Look, and now that I'm 73, I can go back and say to you wholeheartedly, no one has ever created a character like that. And to this day, it's been the only time it's been seen like that. El Pachuco was an original American piece of artistic work. And it was totally American. But I never thought I was going to make any money in this thing. I never thought I was going to be famous or rich. That wasn't the <laughs> that wasn't the idea. The idea was to really just be the best that I could be in whatever it is that I was doing, period. If I was going to sing a song, I want to really, man, put myself deep inside of it to find out, you know, the soul of the music. If I was, you know, playing ball, if I, man, I won batting champion, Golden State batting champion, the state of California for two years in a row. I mean, I really played the game. And then when I got into playing music, um, Jim Morrison would come and watch me perform, you know? <laughs> you know, Judy Garland would watch me perform at the factory, would come in and say, you know, I've never seen anyone like you, Ed. I go, oh, thank you, Judy. That's really an honor, not a She was, you know, kind of in her final years, final months. 
and uh, it was amazing. And and I said to you know, so you know, I, I performed for uh, Sinatra, I performed for the Beatles, I performed for the Stones. Everybody went to that damn nightclub. It was incredible. So I was a performer. And then so I went on to do Zoot Suit. I performed, and the performance was pure, and it was true to the intent of the character. And I developed that character, and I made it something that had never been seen before. And therefore, I sit here in front of you now, very well respected artist. I, I've turned down more than I've turned down things more than I've accepted. I could have been rich and famous. I have a nice life. Uh, not to say that I'm poor, I'm not, but I could have been much more had I taken everything that they offered me, but I didn't do that. I, I only took things that I really wanted to do. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to turn the projects that influenced you into your own language? Overcoming the, the stereotypes and the prejudgments and the discrimination that is brought about on the understanding of the Latino community. They wanted me to change my name. I remember walking into MGM lot and the head of uh, casting over there said, you know, the first thing, Ed, is it, uh, you know, Eddie almost? <laughs> what is that? Uh, I said, what do you mean? It's my name. And he goes, yeah, but I mean, come on, man. Ed Starr or change your name, man. Get it away from the culture and you just have your, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, at that time, Martin Sheen wasn't really Martin Sheen yet. So it was, it was, he was starting to come on board and become something. But I thought Martin Sheen was Martin Sheen. I didn't know he was Ramon Esteves. And he had changed his name. And many people, Rita Hayworth, you know, she changed her name too. And she was a Latina. She was a Mexican woman girl too. And so this, but I didn't know all this. Anthony Quinn, I didn't know Anthony Quinn was Latino, he was Mexican. And because his name was Quinn and his father's real name was Quinn, but they were from Mexico, they were Mexican. And so uh, I said, wow, you know, I, I, and I got so angry at my, you know, inside. And I just looked at the guy and I said, okay, you're right, man. Thank you so much. You really have helped me out an awful lot, you know? And I stood up and I started to walk out the door and I said, I can see it now. Said, That's right. I should put up there, Edward James Olmos, not Ed Olmos. Use my full name. And I walked out the door. And from that moment to today, when you see my marquee, it always has my full name all the way across the board. And I said, you know, people say, why do you use three names? I go, because, uh, you know, it's, it, people you need to understand who I am. And uh, basically, uh, you're lucky I don't use all my name, Edward James Wiesa Santian Olmos, because you blow your brains out. What keeps you optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound? I have been fulfilling my time professionally by doing a lot of work out of my house, like I'm doing right now on Zoom calls and going out in the communities by way of the Zoom, and having a lot of meetings, having a lot of situations happen with the community. Because I really believe that right now the vote is the most important aspect of life. And uh, it's got to, for our democracy to really survive this era that we're in we have to use our vote people have to vote if the majority of the people in this country who can vote vote and make it the strongest vote that's ever been given in in democratic history in this country we will have achieved what is needed to sustain our democracy that being said uh, as far as i'm concerned our future is in our own hands and, and people so it's not in their hands it's in our hands and there's a whole lot of us around here. And that's the interesting part is that people are afraid of us because they don't know us. So they have this uh, discriminatory and prejudicial feeling about us. And when you get to the point of understanding who the us is, it's everybody that doesn't think like you do is the answer so you know it's not i will tell you this ian esco said it the best it's not the answer that illuminates it's the question so uh as far as i'm concerned right now the question is 
uh, will there be change? And uh, that's the question. Does that illuminate you? Yes, it does. You have to think, you know, what are those changes like? What's going to happen in the future? Now, each one of us now has all of a sudden had to, in their own mind, upon hearing the question, come up with their own sense of balance and their own sense of understanding. And you wait for me to talk because I'm in front of the camera, but I ain't going to tell you because change is imminent. It's the only thing that's constant. Guess what? All that's happening right now will change. And all the changes that are coming will be different than they are right now. And people say, well, it could be worse. Yeah, it could, but it could also be better. The decision is up to you. You have the light. We are really, really spiritual beings living in this world as humans, you know, radiate an understanding of light and understanding of positive and goodness. And you make heaven and earth right here.